Hey y'all, thank you for tuning in today. I've got, I thought I'd read to you here in the cemetery where it's kind of uh, quiet and peaceful. Uh, a little mix uh, difference from the day to day. We've had, uh, I've had three people now uh, cancel on me and change their uh, schedules on me today. Had a lady that had to leave town and she says her kids are home and she doesn't want anyone working on her apartment while she's not there and her kids are home, which... I mean, that's that's understandable. And then I've got another one that keeps on telling me, I think you've got the wrong number. We're in XYZ apartment. And I'm like, well, that's, that's the apartment I'm trying to reach. And she goes, oh, well, you didn't talk to me yesterday. I'm like, no, I talked to your husband and he said that everything would be okay and he'd get with you. Well, you can't come over today. So I, I've got that one done. And then I've got another one that was supposed to be a large project that actually is not done or not going to be done because they said that, um, how'd they put it? The owners have not decided whether it's a yay or a nay yet. So I'm, yeah, I'm fighting them over that. And then, I mean... So I've got a lot hopefully scheduled out for Monday because Tuesday I do real estate and then Wednesday I'm packing to leave on vacation. So hopefully everything works out. We'll see. Anyway, we've got Jim Butcher's Proven Guilty. This is book eight of the Dresden Files. Like I said previously, since we're getting over halfway, make sure that you guys go out and purchase, uh, looks like, White Knight, because that's going to be our next book that is uh, coming up. Right now, though, what we're on is we are on chapter 31. So while you guys grab your books, and I'll roll down the window here, create a little breeze for me. But while you guys grab those books and get ready, make sure also to like, subscribe, and share this with others. Let's go ahead here and jump into chapter 31. We listened to Daniel's recounting of the attack. It was simple enough. He heard Molly moving around downstairs and had come down to talk to her, his sister. There had been a knock at the door. Molly had gone to answer it. There had been an exchange of words, and then Molly had screamed and slammed the door. She came running into the living room, Daniel said, and they broke down the door behind her and came in. He shivered. They were going upstairs, and Molly said we had to distract them. So I grabbed the poker from the fireplace and just sort of jumped them. He shook his head. I, I thought they were just costumes, you know, like really stupid burglars or something. But the reaper grabbed me, and he was going to, you know, cut me with that curved knife. He gestured vaguely at his wounded arm. Molly hit him, and he dropped me. With what? I asked him. He shook his head. His thin, awkward, adolescent features were hollow with pain, weariness, and a kind of lingering disbelief. His words were all slightly stiff, wooden, as if reporting events in an unappealing motion picture, rather than the actual experiences. I couldn't see. I think she must have had a bat or something. He dropped me. Then what? I asked. He swallowed. I fell and bumped my head on the floor, and they grabbed her, the reaper and the scarecrow, and they carried her out the door. She was screaming. He bit his lip. I, I tried to stop them, but Hammerhead chased me, so I ran out the back and up to the, into the treehouse, because I figured, you know, he doesn't have any hands, just hammers, so how he's, is he going to climb up after me? He looked up to Charity and said, shame in his voice, I'm sorry, Mom. I wanted to stop them. They were just too big. Tears welled up in his eyes and his thin chest heaved. Charity caught him in a fierce hug, squeezing him hard and whispering to him. Daniel broke down, sobbing. I got up and walked to the far side of the room. Fort Hill joined me there. These creatures, I told him quietly, inflict more than simple physical damage. They rip into the psyches of those they attack. This happened to Daniel? Fort Hill asked. 
I'd have to take a closer look to be certain, but it's probable. Kids gonna have it tough for a while, I said. It's kind of like emotional trauma. Someone dying, that kind of thing. It tears people up the same way. They don't get over it fast. I've seen it too, Fort Hill said. I haven't brought this up yet, but I thought you should know that Nelson came to me earlier this evening. I nodded at the cot that had been occupied when we came in. That him? Yes. How'd he strike you, I asked. Fort Hill pursed his lips. If I didn't know you sent him, I would have thought he was having a bad reaction to drugs. He was almost incoherent, very agitated, terrified in point of fact, though he would not or could not explain why. I managed to get him calmed down, and he all but fainted on me. I frowned, running the fingers in my right hand back through my hair. Did you have a sense that anyone was following him? No, not at all. Though, I might have missed something. He essayed a tired smile. It's late, and I'm not as spry as I used to be after ten o'clock or so. Thank you for helping him, I said. Of course. Who is he? Molly's boyfriend, I said. I glanced across the room at the mother holding her son. Maybe Charity doesn't need to know that part, either. He blinked and then sighed. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, I said. May I ask you a question? He asked. Sure. These uh, creatures, these phages, if they are what you say, beings of the spirit world, then how did they manage to cross the house's threshold? Traditional way, I said. They got an invitation. From whom? Probably Molly, I said. He frowned. I have difficulty believing that she would do such a thing. I felt my mouth tighten. She probably didn't know they were monsters. They're shapeshifters. They probably appeared to her as someone she knew and would invite in. Fort Hill said, Ah, I see. Someone such as you, perhaps? Perhaps, I said quietly. Makes it the second time someone has used my face to get a shot at Michael's family. Fort Hill said nothing for a moment. Then, he said, It occurs to me that these creatures killed without compunction in your previous encounters. Why would they carry Molly away instead of simply murdering her? I don't know yet, I said. I don't know how my spell managed to bring them to Molly. I don't know how precisely what these things are, or where they hail from, which means I can't figure out why they've been showing up, or where they might have taken the girl. I waved a hand in frustrated gesture. It's driving me insane. I've got tons of facts, and none of them are lining up. You're tired, Fort Hill said. Perhaps some rest? I shook my head and cut him off. No, Padre. These things that took her won't rest. The longer she's in their hands, the less likely it is we'll ever see her again. I rubbed at my eyes. I need to rethink it. Fort Hill nodded at me and rose. On the other side of the room, Charity was covering her exhausted son with a blanket. Even Alicia had surrendered to fatigue. And now only the adults were awake. I'll leave you to it then. Have you eaten recently? Sometime in the Mosaic era, I said. Sandwich? My stomach made a gurgling noise. Only if you insist. I'll see to it, Fort Hill said. Excuse me. He went over to Charity and took her arm, leading her out as he spoke quietly to her. Now that her children had been cared for, she looked like she might come apart at the seams. They left the room together, leaving me in the dimness with Mouse and a lot of sleeping kids. I thought. I thought some more. I picked up all the facts I knew, turning them every which way, trying to figure out something, anything that would let me put a stop to this insanity. The phages. The answer was in the phages. Once I knew their identity, I could begin to work out who might be using them, and what I might do to learn more about them. 
There had to be a, a commonality to them somewhere. Something that linked them together. Some fact that could provide me a context in which to judge their motivations and intentions. But what the hell could they have in common, other than being monsters who fed on fear? They'd shown up randomly in a bathroom, a kitchen, a parking lot, a conference room. Their victims had been desperate, seemingly random. They had all appeared as figures from horror movies, but that fact seemed fairly unremarkable, relatively speaking. Try as I might, I could not find nothing to join them together, to let me recognize them. Frustrated, I rose and went over to Daniel's cot. I called up my sight. It took me longer than normal. I braced myself and regarded the boy. It, I'd been right. He'd taken a psychic flogging. The phage had been worrying at his mind, his spirit, even as it had threatened his flesh. I could see the wounds, his long, bleeding tears in his flesh. Poor little guy. It would haunt him. I hoped he would be able to get a little rest before the nightmares woke him. I stared at him for a good while, making sure his suffering was burned inevitably into my head. I wanted to remember for the rest of my life what the consequences of my screw-ups might be. I heard a sound to the side and glanced up, thinking, turning my sight upon the source of the sound. A restless, stirring Nelson. If little Daniel had been the recipient of the savage beating, Nelson's spirit had been in the hands of hell itself. His entire upper body was disfigured under my sight, covered in hideous, festering boils and raw, bleeding burns. The damage was worse around his head, and faded gradually to its descending, his torso. At each of his temples bore tiny, neat holes, sharp and carterized, as if by a laser scalpel just like Rosie. Chains of logic cascaded through my brain. My head swam. I shoved the sight away from me, and my ass fell straight down to the floor. I knew. I knew why my spell had sent the phages after the carpenters. I knew why Molly had been taken. I could make a good guess at where. I knew what the phages all had in common. I knew who had sent them. The realization terrified me with a fear so cold and sharp that it literally paralyzed me. I could barely clap my hand over my mouth to keep from making whimpering sounds. It took me a while to force myself to calm down. By the time I did, Fort Hill had returned bearing sandwiches. He settled down on a cot, clearly exhausted, and went to sleep. I ate my sandwiches. Then I went looking for Charity. I found her in the chapel, sitting up high in the balcony. She stared down at the altar and did not react when I came up the steps to her and settled down on the bench beside her. I sat with her in silence for a minute. Charity, I whispered, I need to ask you something. She sat in stony silence. Her chin moved a fraction of a degree up and down. How long? I murmured. How long since what? She asked. I took a deep breath. How long has it been since you've used your magic? Wow, what? Charity is a wizard? That almost makes me want to go ahead and read the next chapter to you guys. So, you'll want to stay tuned. You'll want to get caught up. Maybe what I'll do is because I've got a little bit of extra time today, is I will go ahead and um, get a couple of drinks in me, relax a little bit, maybe catch a few of these um, stray Pokemon around here, and I will get back to you guys in a little bit. But make sure, go ahead, guys, if you could, uh, like, subscribe, share. Again, thank you guys so very much, and you have a wonderful day.